Um, thanks for coming to this research seminar. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Daniel Castaneda. And Daniel is a PhD candidate in the University of Illinois at uh, Champaign campus. Uh, he did his uh, bachelor degree in Berkeley University, right? And then in 2008, after that, he went to the industry and did some uh, consulting job at Silicon Valley. And uh, so went back to school. And his research is more focused on concrete, fresh property, and the long-term durability of the concrete. So without further ado, I would like to turn the floor back to the Daniel and now it's yours. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for attending. It's a packed room. I like the illusion of this small room. It may look like it's a really packed room, but it is a packed room. So I'm thankful that you guys are all here. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dan Castaneda, and what I'm going to be talking about today is some work that we've been doing over at the University of Illinois in partnership with Kansas State University. Uh, it's a really big project with two PIs and multiple PhD students and dozens of undergraduate research assistants uh, in uh, getting a better idea about the free stop performance of uh, concrete railroad cross ties. Normally I would do a lot more moving around right now, but I'm going to not block the the, the screen, and I think I'm just going to use my fingers here for advancing the slides. Now, most of you guys here have no idea who I am, and there might still be some people coming in late, so I want to give you guys some easy filling material about who I am uh, and where I'm from. I'm from California, and I really like this picture because it was taken on Christmas Day at the beach, and this is in contrast with Illinois, where we get these kind of Midwest miserable white Christmas pictures. <laughs> Uh, so it's a place where I go back often. Because I'm from California, I went over to the UC Berkeley. I did my undergraduate work in civil engineering. Uh, soon after, I ended up working at a uh, so software company in Silicon Valley. They did a lot of data analytics on radar traffic for the Federal Aviation Administration. And my work there was to take a lot of radar data that's processed at different facilities across the US, merge it in so that we could use some analytics on it. Part of that work includes fuel burn analysis of flights that were uh, departing from East Coast airports, making the cross-country haul over to the West Coast, and having a better idea of efficiencies on energy use uh, over their operations. In working in industry, it's great for some people. I was getting kind of bored there, so I tried my stint in just doing some traveling. And I want to just say that I uh, did the Inca Trail. If you get a chance to do this, it's over in Peru. It's a four-day hike, about 40 kilometers. Uh, you start somewhere between Cusco and Machu Picchu, but you end up in Machu Picchu after four days. It's a glorious sight, and walking in there all sweaty and disgusting, but it's really beautiful. Go there before they restrict the number of tourist uh, permits even more. Uh, the mountainside is eroding, so all these crowds of tourists are ruining the mountainside. So hurry up and go there before they don't let you in anymore. You know, feed, feed into the problem. Uh, when I did end up at uh, U of I, I joined the Engineers Without Borders group for a short while. Uh, there was a really nifty project that the student groups were doing there with uh, drinking water quality in impoverished villages in Guatemala. So there was this project where I got involved in this because they were using concrete materials for their biosand filters and they were experiencing a lot of structural damage, a lot of cracking, uh, which would make these biosand filters kind of useless. So there was a, a need there and I had a really good opportunity to travel and work on this project. Really good fulfilling project amongst many others at the UOI, which is where I've been now for the past seven years of my life. Uh, I did a master's there working with some concrete pavements. I moved on to some different materials uh, using geopolymers in my work, uh, working on fast setting repair materials. But really what came out of this is a, a project where I got involved in with uh, concrete cross ties. Um, and it's a really big project and I have a good time with it, and I'll be defending that work very soon, uh, within two to three months. Hence, me looking for a job somewhere in life. Now, the on presentation is, I'll be talking about kind of the bigger ideas of what this project's been about, the motivation behind it, and some of the work that Kansas State has done, because it really motivates and contextualizes the work that we're doing at the U of I, mostly in regards to consolidation, better understanding the rheology of this high flow concrete, uh, and in terms of characterizing environmental conditions, we're concerned with free cell durability, so we care about these wet climates and how cold they can get, how cyclically cold they get, uh, and we have no data set of interest to us. So if part of the work here was to get a really good understanding of this, 
summarizing the project results, we submitted a technical report to the FRA not too long ago, and just some closing remarks about who I am and where I want to go past this dissertation work. So again, this is a very massive project done at two universities. Uh, the motivation for this work, for the most part, is that the Federal Railroad Administration has long been moving, has an interest in moving away from timber cross ties. Cross ties, there are these elements that kind of join the steel rail lines, and the timber ties that are used swell. They take in a lot of water, they're made of wood, and they can require extensive maintenance, and they get replaced every five to ten years. Not the greatest thing for long term maintenance and durability, so there's this interest of using concrete cross ties instead. And in particular, for high-speed rail applications that are eventually going to get built across the nation, uh, including locations like the Midwest, the Great Lakes, and the Northeast, these are concrete material systems that are subject to material degradation mechanisms, including pre-saw damage. And if this stuff will eventually get killed, the FRA wants concrete cross size to come into play, but there's an issue with the durability particularly at the rail seat area. And when I say rail seat area, what I'm talking about is the juncture between the cross tie and the steel rail line. There's, there's been damage that's occurring here, and it manifests itself in the form of scaling. This is a photograph of a few cross ties that were taken out of track because they were no longer serviceable. And it's a problem because we don't want these uh, cross ties out in service, particularly in high-speed rail applications. It's a costly problem. If there's more than three eighths inch lateral movement of that steel rail line with respect to the cross tie, it, uh, by specification, it's going to get pulled out. It's no longer uh, safe to be kept in track. If these are overlooked, then there's a real, real risk of derailment. So it's a problem. It's a costly problem and it's a safety problem. So the FRA is strongly motivated to try to figure out what's going on that's causing these cross ties being built. Now, 2016, these cross ties are still having problems. And in a number of different ways, they're related to structural and material causes. <coughs> I'm more interested in the material causes. Uh, structural reasons that this stuff is happening, we have repeated dynamic load, so we have abrasion, crushing, splitting of the, of the, of the pretensioned uh, tendons. We also have material problems, mostly attributable to the, the, attributable to the presence of water. So when water is present at this real estate area, we get cavitation, erosion, hydraulic pressure. But the thing that we care about for this project, because this is massive, there's multiple research groups at many different universities looking at these different uh, degradation mechanisms. And the work that we were looking at, we were looking at free cell durability. There's a standard test for this, which is ASTM C666. Many of you might know this testing technique. What you do is you take representative concrete samples, you either cast it as a companion sample, or you can excise it out of uh, concrete that's pre-existing, and you subject it to accelerated freeze-thaw testing. You put it in a water bath, and you freeze it, and you take it out of that water bath. You let it thaw out, and then you freeze it again. You do some combination of this where you um, accelerate the extent of freeze-thaw damage, but the issue is with these pre-stressed elements is that when we excise the concrete samples out, they're being subjected to bursting strains, so they have structural damage when they're excised out. And when they're subjected to this material testing technique, there's exacerbated damage that may lead to that cross tie being uh, rated as having failed. So this is a criticism that the, that the manufacturers have for the material, because they say, we have a pre-stressed element. This, this is not a problem for us. The, the, the tendons are strong enough. The, the concrete is a high performance material, so even if there is free saw expansion and there's this tensile stress due to the water expanding, it's, it's no problem. This is high performance concrete, <laughs> but the damage is still occurring, so what's the issue here? So that motivates our research questions. We want to figure out, you know, what is the suitability of this rapid uh, accelerated testing technique on these pre-stressed elements? What's the effect, and as it follows, the effect of consolidation, because we learned there is an aspect of which the manufacturing processes are not ideal. And also just characterizing environmental conditions. These cross ties are out in wet wintry climates. What does that actually do? How does it actually relate to the internal properties? So, the work that Kansas State was doing, they were really focusing in on this accelerated testing technique. They built this very massive free saw chamber that can accommodate many different samples, including these whole-scale cross ties. Uh, each of these things are very heavy. They each one weighs about 800 pounds. So this was a very reinforced freestyle chamber uh, that they were able to use to test these cross ties and full-scale, half-scale 
configurations. And the point here is that if we do this kind of testing, what we learn is there are inconsistencies. We can get cross ties straight from the manufacturers, and they'll do well in this testing technique. They, they, they perform well. They're the best concrete ever. And then from that same manufacturing plant, we get these cross ties that just fail. They fall apart. And there's these ways of uh, characterizing the extent of that where we just measure you know, factors such as uh, mass loss or um, relative dynamic modulus of elasticity, how much inherent cracking is present in your material. Uh, we can detect that. And there's inconsistencies, whether we're using uh, companion cast specimens or excising pre-stress samples, half prep, half sample, half cross tie samples or full soil <coughs> cross tie samples. Something's going on. We have inconsistencies. So what's going on at the manufacturing process where we're getting this uh, inconsistent type of performance? Because this is how bad this problem looks from a material standpoint. We take our, our cross ties, perfect concrete. We subject it to accelerated free cell testing. If someone were to walk that down the, the track and see this, they can see that maybe there would be some splitting. They might attribute some of this to structural damage. But this is all material related. And it's compounded by other factors. It's compounded by other material failures. It's compounded by other structural failures. So this is, it's a bad problem. And this is real concrete. That's not the field uh, that, that's being used in place. So in that manufacturing process, what's going on? Well, we know they're mixing the concrete and they measure the air the fresh air constant, and we'll talk a little bit about why they would do this. But when they mix this concrete, they're meant to be, but there are systems that play that can vary from plant to plant. They can vary, they can consolidate their concrete in different ways. They can either uh, vibrate using handheld vibrators. They can have mechanized ways of vibrating that fresh concrete where they have these pokers and they drag it across the fresh concrete right behind where they've just poured the concrete. Or very popularly, they use uh, form vibrators, which is kind of what's depicted down here, which is you've got these discrete vibrators that are attached to the steel mold. So at one end of your process where you've just started your your uh, production for the day, you're vibrating the steel form. And that steel form is propagating all of that vibrational energy a thousand feet down. Forty minutes later in that process, you've finally gotten concrete build up the entire way. At the very end of that process, you have a concrete cross tie that's been consolidated for two or three minutes. Fantastic. That's all we need. That fresh concrete at the beginning has been vibrated for 40 to 50 minutes. That doesn't sound like it's optimal. It sounds like there's kind of a mismatch of what's going on. And what this is leading to is a case where when we dose our fresh air at mixtures for our concrete, we get maybe an acceptable amount of entrained air at the mixer. Maybe not so much once we're traveling along those drops, those, those buckets and chutes during the traveling. <coughs> And then after vibration, after this ultimate consolidation, we're losing our air and maybe not retaining everything that we thought we would want to be retaining. This contextualizes our work. So there's some problem with the manufacturing process where our consolidation, consolidating efforts are not optimized. And they're not optimized principally because consolidation by, by design, it's for strength and density. It's not for the retention of these air rules. It's not for any other optimized product. It's for strength and density. So when we think about these entrained air bubbles in hardened concrete, we want them there in a free cell bin. Because these microscopically sized air bubbles in concrete act as pressure relief valves for freezing water. When that, when that liquid water freezes, it expands by volume by about 9%. It exerts tensile forces. And these entrained air bubbles in hardened concrete help us. They alleviate that stress buildup. So when we lose them, that's a problem for our free stop performance. Kansas State was interested in looking at this problem from the chemical admixture selection point of view and how vibration affects uh, based on the selection of admixtures. You and I, this is where we did here because we care more about the physical constituents and be able, being able to uh, understand this problem from a physical standpoint. And really what we're interested in is saying, can we describe this mechanism maybe not so much with admixtures, but more so mechanical properties? maybe fresh mechanical properties, where we have concrete with suspended air bubbles in a neat, this is a neat concrete system. And we subject it to some sort of vibration, and we know that there's some type of rheology, some kind of response to this. Air bubbles maybe uh, that are previously suspended can uh, begin to rise and escape our material system. That would make sense with what it is that we're seeing at the manufacturing processes. So we can take advantage of this. Fresh concrete, it's pretty much fluid. What does elementary fluid mechanics tell us? 
Well, it tells us that if we have an air bubble within a viscous fluid, we have some kind of buoyant force acting on that bubble. We have resistive drag forces acting on those bubbles. And we can make a prediction for just how fast these things should be moving in any kind of system. And when we consider typical paste, well, the velocity at which this stuff flows, or the, the, the size of bubbles that we're considering, is very, very slow. It's only order of a micron per second. So if I'm vibrating this stuff for two or three minutes, a micron per second, this thing's barely moving. Even 40, 50 minutes, that's not a lot of travel distance. So what is it about this problem that we're not capturing with basic elementary cube mechanics? So there must be something else at play. And part of what it's play here is both we have uh, size, geometric size of our uh, bubbles as an issue, but we also have our rheology as an issue. The, the aspect that our viscosity may not be what we think it is. Rheology, it's the study of the flow of materials. It's being able to give it mechanical properties and error to make predictive measurements. Uh, in our work, we're using a concrete rheometer that's commercially available. And really, all it's doing is, is taking a vein propeller, applying some type of torque, measuring the response. And with that, we can get uh, a relationship between torque and speed. Think about this as force and displacement in any kind of structural application. And we can relate these values to more fundamental units of as a yield stress uh, and a strain rate, you know, something that's a little more inherent to the material. And when we do this for concrete, we can infer some information if we plot this stuff out. We get a y-intercept. That's a yield stress. That's how much force is required in order to make a material flow. Otherwise, it's like peanut butter. It's not going to want to go anywhere. It will stay where it's at. If we really suppress that yield stress down, maybe we care about the slope of our response a little more. That's how sticky the material is. Think of water versus honey versus asphalt. It's the, the, the flow of the material once it's actually moving. We can do the same thing for concrete, and when we do this for concrete, we get, for the most part, a linear type of relationship. It's a very simple fluid, and when we take experimental measurements of, our, of the concrete that we were using for this project, concretes that were typical uh, for the precast manufacturers, very sticky, uh, use a lot of admixtures to super plasticize the mix, have it be high flow, uh, we can really suppress down that yield stress, but then have really sticky properties as a material. All right, whatever. So we measure this. We understand rheology. What we don't understand is that rheology, as it's being subjected to any kind of external consolidation, work's been done in this field, but no one's got a really good understanding of what quick mechanisms are. Uh, so in our work, what we did was we took our rheometer setup, and we separated out that vein geometry from the container, and vibrated the container with the fresh fluid to see what the response is. And what we observed was something kind of uh, interesting, which is we took our yield stress concrete, or our yield stress paste, it had some kind of a y-intercept, and now we're somehow removing that yield stress entirely. We have some kind of effect uh, where our yield stress is being depreciated down towards the origin. So now this stuff at really low shear strain rate is behaving more like a water. Well, that makes sense for concrete, right? We're consolidating it, that's what we're doing to make it flow. But what's weird about this is that we're driving the viscosity so far down that our, that our air bubbles now are just freely flowing upwards. So that's our observation. That's the observation. Can we predict this? Well, that's still ongoing. Right, and concrete is more drastically affected than this than the paste is. Can we work to predict this? We have some preliminary work, but it's still ongoing because the scope of the work will go on for many more years because this is kind of a new area that we've been looking at for the concrete material system. It hasn't really been looked at. It, has, it hasn't been looked at for the concrete material system, but it has been looked at in other fields, and that's useful for us because we can adapt and borrow from the other fields and try to better understand our concrete problem. And in this case, we know that we can make estimations for changing local viscosities, changing yield stress due to these very instantaneous oscillating changes in the volume packing of the aggregates. If we're oscillating material, the aggregates are separating apart, they're coming back together, so that's inducing some kind of local change in the viscosity. Well, that's one way of looking at this. We tried it out, wasn't giving us the best results. Something that was a lot better for us is work that came out more recently uh, in rheological studies, which is to think of concrete as a granular system. That makes sense. We've got rocks in there, it's a granular system. And it's got some trademarks about what uh, that does. And part of what it can also do is there's this expression that can predict the, the, the separation of these contact forces. When these contact forces get separated, there's this kind of predictive shape for the viscosity that closely matches what we were observing in our radiological measurements. 
So with that, what we can do is feed it into simple, neat models where we take our granular aspect and we can take a look at our distribution of air. All right, if we have distribution of air that's normalized, that's our V0, we have it at one, that's our initial air distribution, and we subject it to some kind of vibration, aggregates or changes in the local viscosity, and that can drive uh, a change in the distribution of our air. When that vibration is really maximized, we get an apparent uh, viscosity that's really lowered. Uh, an example, we're going from 14 to about one, and that really drives all of our air out in the span of just about 100 seconds of vibration, about a minute and a half. Not too much time to lose out about half of our distribution of air, an order of magnitude of our air. And when we minimize that um, vibration, we can retain our air more so. So that's kind of where the work's gone for now, and some practical implications of what this stuff means. Because those are just the numbers. But what does this stuff actually mean for concrete and for our granular systems? Well, it has an effect on our radius of action. That's a word that's kind of been used for consolidation of concrete. Uh, we want our vibrators, our vibration, to extend past just where we're vibrating. We want our material uh, from a certain distance to be vibrated. In a, in a surrogate fluid that we're using called carbopol, we can simulate the, the rheology of cement paste, uh, give it a, a designable, tunable yield stress, uh, tunable plastic viscosity, and put these steel ball bearings at the top surface and vibrate the material. And when we do that, maybe we get a steel ball bearing drop uh, some distance if we're near the probe. Well, that's not really what our concrete or cement paste does. So we instead look at that same fluid material system with glass beads in them. They represent kind of maybe more so mortar. Well, we get a propagation of that and vibrational energy, but we also have changes in our rheological structure, and we get this kind of radius of action where at the surface we see more of our material engaged, but because of the granular nature of this, we also kind of get uh, uh, geotechnical kind of um, depth dependence of our rheology because we have <coughs> gravity acting on our aggregates. So we have granularity affecting <coughs> our radius of action. Well, in concrete, when we vibrate concrete and paste, we also see this manifest itself in a different way. If we measure our fresh air content as it's being vibrated with increasing amounts of time, uh, then in concrete we see loss in air. Well, that's what we saw in the manufacturing processes. <coughs> Our concrete's getting vibrated, we drive the air out. But without the presence of the aggregates or the sands, with our paste that we vibrate this stuff, we don't see that same appreciable amount of entrained air loss, fresh air loss. So there's something about the aggregates that's contributing to uh, shearing of our interstitial paste in the concrete. And ultimately, this has a ramification on our freestyle performance. Because when we're losing this entrained air, due to these changes in the rheological properties, we get changes in the freestyle performance. We see these cross ties being inconsistent. A way of maybe better understanding our entrained air population is not so much caring about the fresh air content, but focusing more so on the hard air. <coughs> and there's a standard test technique to use this. You use a microscope, you take a polished concrete section, and you look into the microscope, and all you're doing is you're statistically counting. What do you see? I see an air bubble. All right, if you move the stage over, what do you now see? Well, I see an aggregate. Well, you'll see an error, and you'll kind of repeat this process, and you have some kind of statistically derived distribution of your trained air points. All right, it's a little time consuming. You need a specialist to do this. So, we wanted to kind of follow up on the technique that had been developed by the Michigan Tech Group. Uh, what they do is they take a polished uh, cross section of concrete and they blacken that surface with black ink. And then they draw a contrast to that entrained air by putting in white powder into the voids and then get a pretty good distribution of the air voids. But we lose some information about the aggregates because we, we didn't know our pace content. So, at Illinois and Kansas State, we kind of worked with a new method where instead of blacking the surface, which itself is kind of time consuming, we can instead just use a phenol failing stain. Why not? Our concrete hasn't carbonated anyway. We can do that to draw a contrast to our cement paste. We leave our aggregates alone, and we use a fluorescent orange powder to draw highlight to the entrained air bubbles in the air bubbles. And when we do this, we can segment the image out from our scanned image over on the right, on the right, your left, my right, um, and kind of get a statistical understanding of the distribution and the size of these air bubbles. And when we do that, we can at least compare to our hardened air properties. Uh, in, in a study that we had, we did a blind study with uh, samples that were tested at a lab using <coughs> these seven techniques. And separate from that, we were running our own statistical uh, analysis using the technique, 
and for air void percent, there's agreeable values for total air. And we can move this forward and say, well, we can also get distribution of air sizes uh, as a function of how much we're vibrating. So we can see uh, distribution envelopes be subjected to depreciations because we're increasing vibration times. And we can extend this for different real optical mixes, uh, mixes with different volume constants, aggregates. So this kind of just encapsulates the work that we've done to start this process. Something that's a little more focused in with what we're going on, what we're working on now is we want to be able to have an actual design guideline because we're gaining a better understanding of the physics and what's governing this in our granular or concrete system, but we don't have a design guideline. We don't have something where we can say to someone as a manufacturer, hey, we understand your manufacturing process, we've taken that one measurement, and as such, we dictate that you should no vibrate uh, with no more than some certain energy or some certain time vibration. That's our next step. That's what we have to get to. And one way of getting there is by taking just representative concrete prisms, these modulus of rupture beams are sizable, six inch by six inch, and vibrating at one end, there are different mixes made up of different uh, contents of aggregates uh, inherent with different rheological properties. Do this some kind of uh, image analysis and compare it with what, with um, accelerotory uh, values that we that we measure during the fresh process, so we can better correlate extent of peak acceleration in our fresh material with the extent of air loss. So in this graph, what we have is a sample that had not been vibrated, having about its target 10% air, and when we vibrated it for 60 seconds, we see this kind of depreciation of our hardened air percent. So that's interesting. Can you at least see this and quantify this? And what's a little more interesting is this is falling within the range of the recommended guidelines for how we should vibrate our materials. For this material system, we were targeting where we were still experiencing air loss, two to four Gs of acceleration for vibration. Well, that's optimal for strength and density, but it's not optimal for this air system where we have a high flow concrete. Anything past eight inches, we're, we're not designing our vibration systems in line with the concrete materials that have emerged since the advent of the atmosphere, since the 60s and 70s. We're not updating our design guidelines. So this work feeds into that and we'll get a better understanding for that and hopefully better design guidelines. Now, this first half of the work has been talking about the entrained air. Entrained air helps us against pre-saw durability problems. But if you don't have water in our high performance concrete, in our strong high performance concrete, then we don't have a pre-saw problem. So what is the actual state of liquid moisture inside these cross ties? Well, let's have a better understanding of that because cross ties sit on very well-drained ballasts, of course, because they're perfect material systems. Well, you know, this is just a little funny picture that I like because it really shows that if the ballast gets fouled, you have a slower amount of drainage in your, in your ballast, which isn't the biggest problem. There are ways of mitigating that and cleaning it. Um, and in particular, in terms of the railroad industry, they've cared about uh, freezing uh, issues in their ballast in the form of frost heaving. This is when, after a very long winter, your ballast is very saturated, it's frozen, it's kind of expanded and swelled. And when springtime comes around, all of that ice and snow melts away, and you have this volumetric change in your ballast, which leads to really curved track. And one quick, easy band-aid fix is put up a yellow flag that tells the trains, slow down, your steel rail line is bent here, you don't want to be going too fast. Well, you know, this, this is kind of how the industry handles it. But that's a separate problem, because we care more so about the material damage than the concrete cross side itself. So what is the state of liquid water at the rail seat area? Uh, and that's become our question, because when we get these cross sides being pulled up, we get these very characteristic water damage surfaces. So either hydraulic pressure, cavitation erosion, free saw damage, a combination of all of this stuff. And the rail seat area is kind of just a cartoon depiction of what it's specifically made of. For the most part, there's some steel rail line sitting on top a insulating polyurethane pad. Uh, it sits atop the actual cross tie, and the cross tie itself is sitting in the aggregate ballast. So let's get a better idea. Let's actually instrument some of these cross ties at the manufacturing process plant, get them installed in track, and just see what the values are that we measure. So when we do this, we build up our little sensor system. We use temperature and humidity probes, as well as moisture sensors that are used more so for agriculture, because people in the wine business want to know how to optimally water um, their, their vegetation 
so that they're not over uh, over wetting the great products. So we use very small sensors, about the size of a quarter, get these installed at the manufacturing process, at that real estate area, buried in concrete, and hope that the sensors work. And they do. Once we have these cross ties, we can install them in track or in, in simulated track conditions across uh, different regions of North America. We chose two different regions because they are free style. They're, they're really cold places. One is British Columbia. Uh, due to weather patterns, there's an estimation of about 100 free cell cycles per year. Uh, I'm sorry, 80, because 100 free cell cycles occurs over in Illinois, which is where we're located, um, over two hours away. And we choose these sites because we would anticipate a high number of free cell cycles, so our cross sites will see some action in the span of two years. Um, UBC Okanagan, very friendly grad students who were collecting data on our behalf over at the British Columbia site. These sensors are wired, so they have to physically have their data collected. Any kind of radio frequency data or anything where you can remotely send out data through the internet, fantastic stuff, should be looked at, makes life a little easier. In any case, we have experimentally measured humidity values. We can take advantage of the fact that concrete is a porous media. It has these characteristic properties like diffusivity. It's a way of governing whether uh, moisture is uh, transferring through the material as a gas or as a liquid or as a combination of both things and feed this into a model that the pavement engineers use because they care about curling as a problem. Thermal and moisture curling. If you have moisture in a concrete slab, if it's really wet at top, then it's going to expand the concrete and that's going to cause deflection and then cause cracking. Uh, and the same is true vice versa. So let's see if we can borrow from pavement engineers. We're also interested in the actual freezing events. So we need to know our temperatures. So I like this picture because it kind of showcases a little zoom in the area, but my advisor really hates it because he says, Dan, this is, th this is not even a complete rail section. Look at this, this, a train, this is not real. Well, it's not real, but it kind of points out kind of the layered system, so I like it for that reason, so I'll keep the picture. But we have our measure temperature values. We can make use of a model that takes, again, use of weather data and just build up another predictive model. And we're not directly measuring solar radiation, but it's something that we need. But we can at least rely on the folks over in meteorology. They have interest in being able to predict solar radiation. So we can borrow from them again, use that to feed it into yet another pavement engineering model. Again, they care about thermal uh, curling. Mostly they care about surface course, base materials, soils. They can care about a multi-layered system of concrete and aggregates. Well, we can borrow from them, kind of modify their expression, and use it more so for our polyurethane, our steel, our aggregate, and concrete. And the governing principle should still be the same. It's just material properties. And when we borrow from both of these fields and put this together, we get a pretty nice correlation for a one-dimensional model to our three-dimensional cross-type problem. Pretty good in the winter. We have this strong correlation between our measured temperature values of our instrumented cross ties and predicted temperatures. I'm not showing the data, but this model is terrible in the summer months. But again, we're okay, because it's a free solve problem. We'll care about more so with the winter. And so there's limitations on being able to transfer one-dimensional models to three-dimensional problems. But for our model data set that we have for two years, pretty good in the winter. So again, over that same two-year time period, let's predict the temperature distribution within our cross tie. Um, we have this over two years. And let's put these two together our freezing events, where we have a temperature above zero degrees Celsius, uh, instances in which it drops down below zero, and when we have a critical instance of moisture. And we don't have both, maybe we don't have an actual freeze-thaw cycle, because nothing really happened. Uh, vice versa is true, and we only have both happening together, then we can count that as a freeze-thaw cycle. And if we do that, well, we can predict the cumulative number of freeze-thaw cycles over any arbitrary time span for the two years that we were considering. We can look at the cumulative number based on air temperature, so just not even concrete in the picture. And when we look at this, well, we get 80, 90 that first year, and we're up to about 180. This kind of makes sense for a British Columbia data set because that's historically what the data is. And when we measured it over our two year span, we agree with that. For our concrete at the surface, where it's almost nearly saturated most of the time, we have a very high number of freeze-thaw cycles. As we start to go deeper into the concrete, we reduce the number of our freeze-thaw cycles, our preachable freeze-thaw cycles, because the extent of liquid moisture isn't there. Is this 
helping us or not helping us with our cross site problem? It's helping us to better understand that we have a scaling problem. This is a very surface artificial damage, which is still a problem in the application. Maybe this were a pavement problem, it wouldn't be so bad. The, the ride to work would be a little bumpier, but you wouldn't be having such a high number of free cell cycles at the interior of pavement, causing real significant structural damage or material damage. But we have a surface scaling problem in our cross ties, and that's a problem. So we can elucidate this information from this. So that's the big picture. That was the, the big project, and summary points that we have with this kind of combines the stuff that Kansas State was doing with the work that we were doing at U of I. Uh, we submitted a technical report, massive document. I can share it with you if you'd like. It's kind of a preview of what the dissertation of mine will look like. But the general findings are that, yes, pre-stressed elements have an effect on accelerated testing techniques. Considerations have to be made. Precast companion beams that are not stressed are probably more representative of the material resilience of the material than excising samples from the, the process itself. We confirm that there is this loss of air due to handling, not even final placement, but the handling of the material from wherever it's mixed to the point of final placement. These methods are introducing consolidation vibration leading to uh, our loss of air and potentially other problems with segregation of, of our aggregates. And we also advance uh, techniques for image analysis and have an actual database for cross-type conditions. We don't, we didn't have this before, but now we do. Uh, the recommendations in the report for quality control at final placement, that's being the emphasis because that's where the final parameters will be. Um, and loosening of a surface quality finish specification called bug holes. If you ever walk around outside and you see concrete with all these little pockmarked holes soon after placement, well, those are bug holes and precast manufacturers don't really like them. So there's a specification that says, make sure that when you have a finished product, that this thing is a nice glassy surface with none of these park marked bug holes. Well, how do you achieve that? You vibrate the heck out of your concrete, which is a problem for the iron treatment. Uh, so this specification is kind of a problem for us. So we recommend loosening that requirement. Acknowledgements, because this, again, was a very massive, expensive project. So thank the money makers, the Federal Railroad Administration, for giving uh, my advisor, David Lang, at the U of I, and Kyle Wright in the PI over at Kansas State, uh, the support and the patience over the few years. Lots of PhDs working on this, particularly four with undergraduates. I want to note the industrial partners, because this is rare for them to have opened their doors to us. It's a very, uh, it's a very closed business. They don't want outsiders coming in. Uh, so for us to even be able to enter their manufacturing facilities to instrument their cross ties, have access to the rail yards, was a big deal and there's a level of trust that they had with us and, and we're very happy for their participation. Closing remarks. Because this work isn't where I stop here and I think many of the older uh, faculty here know this topic very well, that the National Academy of Engineering has this rallying call for all engineers saying, hey, we've got these like big problems facing all of humanity and we can call them as 14 grand challenges uh, for the students who maybe don't know this. And they vary across many different disciplines and I kind of just summarize them as being related to either energy, health, security, or environmental concerns. And what's nice about the area of work that I'm going into is that in terms of restoring and improving the urban infrastructure system, we can touch on all of these things. I'm not restricted to any one topic, and none of us are. And another thing that's fantastic is that the infrastructure in this country is falling apart, at least politically. So there's opportunities for being able to uh, excite people about uh, repair materials or structure testing techniques. Concrete as a material, we know that it's the most widely used material in the world, but we are transitioning away from an era where we are focusing on the new construction. We are entering an era where maintenance and repair and rehabilitation of this infrastructure is as important, if not more, than the original construction. And in this, we can move into novel materials or smart modern train, anything that feeds into this idea of sustainability. Well, these are the words that everybody throws around, and it's fine because it's the rallying cry. It's what we're all moving into. But for sustainability, I just want to note that, yeah, no, we are considering life cycle, the period of a grade. But the thing that's really important for me, and it should be important for everyone here, is we also should be caring about everything in between. Because as engineers, we get this mindset of, if we build it, they will come. 
if we build that interstate system or if we build that coal power plant, society must be happy. Well, oftentimes we kind of displace or burden uh, politically uh, unrepresented people, people who maybe don't have the resources to fight back against these solutions that get forced upon them. And especially in the developing world, these resources don't always get embraced by the local communities. So we come up with a biosand filter, we say, here's your system, it cracks. The children still get sick. We hate the engineers. How dare you have come and sold us this product that doesn't work? An entire community becomes shut down, shut off to your solutions. So there's a lot of people uh, and societal types of issues that I think should be taken into account. In any case, I kind of want to just point out that you know, Purdue's already been a leader in alternative materials. Uh, there's been work here uh, with regards to blended cements to reduce CO2 emissions. Other researchers across the world are looking, are looking at other alternative materials like geopolymers. Uh, it's a material that doesn't use any foreign cement, has a very different chemistry than what you're familiar with with foreign cement. I did some work with this in terms of using alkali uh, activated, using uh, using chemically altered aggregates, including lightweight aggregates, in order to control setting behaviors and ultimately mechanical performance of the geopolymers. Uh, it worked that into a proposal um, that can be redeveloped to kind of to be ex more expansive. But the notion is here that we have a material that is very finicky and works in ideal lab conditions, but ultimately, if it's going to be a repair material or a construction material, it's got to be more robust. So identifying mechanisms by which we can use aggregates as a, as a cheat code or admixtures that traditionally don't work in foreign cement at all, but can work in these materials, cheat codes to get them to actually work as a construction material, or if not, at least a repair material. In smaller volumes, faster setting, we can control these things. And actually, as a repair material, we love it when things set fast and have high strength in the span of 15 minutes. Maybe as concrete, mass construction, we don't like that. So, novel materials being as, as a line of work, uh, recycled materials, any kind of inclusion of aggregates that are coming from other sources. We're always having an interest in instrumenting kind of demonstration projects. I like these pictures because they kind of just showcase some of the things that I've been involved with over the years. We've done a lot of pavement instrumentation over at the O'Hare Airport. Uh, I like this picture over here particularly because it was a nighttime job where we had instrumented uh, a joint pavement. I can talk in more details about it maybe after the fact. But it was a pavement that we had isolated with fibers uh, as, a, as a replacement of the reinforcement. And we had instrumented with strain gauges and had this 12 hour period in which aircraft traffic uh, were going through that pavement. So we collected uh, a bit of data set for, for these new systems. All right, just fun stuff, new opportunities. Something to just always keep in mind, you may not always be able to instrument stuff, but we can always kind of develop new non-structured testing techniques. This is part of a proposal that I developed a while ago, um, and the idea is something that others have looked at, which is to take microwave radiation and being able to detect extensive freeze uh, fronts or moisture fronts in concrete, and being able to have a better understanding of how damaged our concrete materials are. But in any case, general overall chain research vision for myself. Who am I as a researcher? Well, concrete. And no matter what the application is, whether we're using different binders, or we're using different aggregates, or different admixtures, things will be affected. Things like the chemistry, the microstructure, ultimately the material and mechanical performances and the properties. And the problem here, or at least the gap that we have in our information is, as these technologies are emerging from research groups across the world, Everyone has their specialization, but right now there's a gap in the knowledge of how durable these things are. Or are they even good infrastructure materials? They may not be. So we have to build in this data set, and I think Purdue has a wonderful suite of testing facilities, even within the city materials group. The Panko lab, the semi-chemistry lab, and the Conquer lab, fantastic. The shared facilities are fantastic. And I think there's opportunity to even uh, enhance those with real logical uh, equipment for motors and other important cement-based materials. Overall teaching vision, I think students tend to get excited about this stuff because it kind of has this facet of changing the world. You're making the world the right place. So you get excited about this. And something that I like in the National Academy of Engineering is if you get to kind of get the students encouraged about this, they may get really proficient with the tech content, but there's still a challenge because if you want to be the leader, a leader in the industry, 
you have to be able to communicate it well. And you communicate it well through uh, group projects, being able to uh, participate in industry activities, getting to talk to different people. So I, that's kind of what governs my teaching philosophy and how I taught courses in the past over at Illinois. And in terms of filling the gap here at Purdue, I would be very happy to teach in some of the undergraduate level courses and being able to just, I think, what I call revive certain courses that have been taught over the years but maybe have ebbed away uh, with repair methodologies, selection of repair materials, non-destructive evaluation of infrastructure because it forms a more well-rounded civil engineer, ultimately. So with that, I open it to questions. <laughs>